Without further ado, please give a warm Schmookon 2000 welcome to our next speaker. Thank you. I'm just not, not even going to pretend I'm going to stand behind the podium here. I'm a little bit short for this. So um, I apologize to the camera crew. I'll wander around a little bit. Um, yeah, so thank you guys for coming. Um, I know this was probably a little bit hard for you guys to get up by noon, deal with your hangover. I'll try not to make this too technical. Who all here is, is like really hungover right now? <laughs> oh, come on. All right, so I got all the, all the nerds who just, just played Team Fortress and didn't drink. Unacceptable. All right. Anyhow, so I um, went through and with a very lovely team of people here, wrote a decompiler over really the past eight months. This is actually supported from, um, by Battelle, the company that I work for, and we're doing this work with the Air Force Research Lab. Um, that's why you have the public uh, release statement down there. They've actually been very good to us um, and are letting us publish quite a bit of our work. So I'll talk to you a little bit about kind of their, their position in here a couple slides down. But thank you very much for letting me be here, talk, and enjoy this. Um, and this should be a lot of fun for you guys. Um, I'm Katie. Um, I did some of the work, and I came up with most of the crazy ideas. So you'll, you'll see the crazy ideas later. Um, so this is going to be a fairly, um, a fairly kind of walk into and out of the realm of making a decompiler. Um, so we're, I'm going to walk through kind of the, a little bit of background as far as why one would like to do this, why I had to do this, why in 2020 anyone's still writing decompilers. Um, and then I'm actually going to jump into how I've done this. So for you guys who have been using Ida and Ghidra for, for uh, many a year and just kind of press the decompile button and have no idea how it works on the back end and have never thought of this, this will actually give you some food for thought and kind of explain why they suck so badly. You decompiled your presentation, bravo. <laughs> so, um, I know most of you guys, how, how many here know what Verilog is? Okay, so I got some of the hardware people. I have slides for the people who don't know what Verilog is. Um, so there will be hardware for software people. For those of you who have gone to SmooCon as a hardware person and braved this journey not knowing what a decompiler is just solely to see my talk, there are also hardware or software for hardware people slides. Um, so here's hardware for software people. I'm going to use a lot of different terminology in here. I'll try to introduce it. Please feel free to interrupt me if you don't understand what's going on, and I will shamelessly mock you. All right. So here's the software for, uh, for a hardware people slide. For those of you who have never heard of a decompiler before, the basic idea is you go through and you can very easily turn binary into assembly code. And assembly code has not really been read by anyone since like the late 70s, except for the people who were Bitcoin mining on GPUs back in the day. And they had to slog through it for a while, and then they quit doing that too. And no one really writes or reads assembly anymore because it's just miserable. You have to, you have to deal with assembly some reverse engineering but you really want to do as little static analysis as possible. And when you do, having a decompiler really helps this be a lot more readable and you not just get lost in four gigabytes of random instructions, half of which you don't understand. Because, I mean, there are just way too many x86 instructions and then ARM has all of the weird ones and just, uh, who knows. Um, so, anyhow, I'm going to follow the same methodology that people use in software, in hardware. Um, it's not going to work very well in a few places, and we'll actually have to talk about some of the, um, some of the things I had to change to go from software to hardware. 
So this is the, my general workflow here with the Verilog to Verilog decompiler. And yes, it is exactly as advertised. It decompiles Verilog netlist into Verilog RTL. So uh, this is actually one of the unique advantages of this. Most decompilers don't end up in the same language they start out with, so I can really recompile anytime I want and go through and check and make sure my I have things that are formally equivalent or pass functional testing, and I'm not like just making a complete mess out of the net list. So, um, as I said, there are a fair number of differences between hardware and software. I've heard a couple of people in the past say, oh, you can't use software techniques in hardware, this couldn't possibly work. Um, they're mostly wrong. They're really just not quite imaginative enough. Most of the software stuff does work. Some of it doesn't. Um, a lot of it use, required a little bit of shoehorning to get it to work. Um, we're also frequently in either the very easy or the very hard cases of the software decompiler methodology. All right. So as far as why you need a hardware decompiler, this is all the normal reasons one would use a decompiler for definitely not nefarious purposes. Um, and then on top of it, hardware has a couple of issues that software doesn't have. First of all, hardware is, once you make hardware, you've made the hardware. You can't really fix the hardware. You have to be really, really, really sure there are no bugs in your hardware before you ship it out, or you have to wait the six months till someone throws your device in the trash and buys another one, and then you fix it that time around. Um, but there's also a big problem, and this is what AFRL is mostly worried about it, with counterfeit electronics, where um, people will go through and try to figure out what your hardware does, make a knockoff copy, and then sell that to you as the real thing, just like you counterfeit anything else. It's, it's a big multi-billion dollar industry, and it's been a huge problem for the DOD because they actually need high reliability systems. They want your average 18-year-old saying, hold my beer, to be what's crashing their tanks and airplanes, and not because they have counterfeit CPUs. So um, I, in general, do a lot of anti-counterfeiting research, and this is honestly part of this. What happens if you get a hold of something counterfeit? Where did it come from? All of that good jazz. All right. Now, the technical reason why one would write a hardware decompiler. Um, so I actually tried when I first started this. Um, we have a, a big research effort, like I said, around anti-counterfeiting, um, where we're basically doing hardware teardowns. Um, at Battelle, and um, the guy who's in charge of this came and approached me, and he's like, oh, you know a little bit of software and firmware stuff. Um, we can get netlists. What do we do with those netlists? And I'm like, well, there's all these software tools. They've been around. Really, de decompilers have been around since the 60s, believe it or not. Um, they are older than probably everyone in this room, at least those of you who are willing to admit to your age. Um, so why didn't I just leverage an existing decompiler? Well, I tried. It didn't work at all. Um, basically, the, I tried Binary Ninja, which anyone here from Binary Ninja? Okay. Anyhow, great product, works fantastically. You need an instruction pointer. Really, if you don't have instruction set and an instruction pointer, Binary Ninja is not going to do you a whole lot of good. So I, I kind of gave that up, idea up. Um, there is some existing work. I'll um, talk about some of that throughout my talk. A lot of it, though, is targeted towards FPGA netlists, where you have a lot more information. These are actually annotated to some um, way. We're looking at ASIC netlists, which are literally just a mishmash of nasty looking wires with artificially named uh, generated names they don't nothing corresponds to anything it's it's a complete just just random jumble of of nastiness um, so the the structure that was present in the FPGA netlist is not present in the ASIC netlist um, and on top of that if you rely on the structure that say um, Vivado produces then your tool set is limited to only Vivado and I didn't want that so um, I had to generalize at a level that hasn't really been done before. 
Um, and then on top of it, this was, once I started into it, I've really had a blast with this project. I, I am a mathematician by training and I haven't gotten to do a lot of graph theory since I left school. And this is uh, pretty much all graph theory. So enjoy that. All right. Uh, what do people do right now for hardware testing? For those of you who are software people and you don't know, hardware people, like I said, have to actually test way better than software people from a quality standpoint because you can't fix things in, you know, bug fixes or, or the next release or whatever. People actually have to go out and buy the next version where stuff is fixed. Um, there's also a lot of things that get covered up, but that's a completely different um, discussion, not for today. Um, I can rant if you want, but in general, people use formal equivalence testing. They use set solvers. Um, and this is basically, if you're talking about fuzzing, you fuzz every possible input and make sure every possible output is exactly the same. Um, there are some niceties over top of it that improves your runtime, but in general, right now hardware is scaling. We're getting more and more complex devices and a lot more stuff in your device. We're getting systems and packages. Um, we're, we're getting really complex chips and SAT solvers just don't scale very well. I don't know if you can read the, the access there, but uh, you can run your SAT solver for a while and have it not get very far. All right, so next thing, question was why am I doing this in Verilog? Any of you guys who are hardware people know there's Verilog and VHDL, and basically all the government guys still use VHDL, everyone else uses Verilog, everyone complains a little bit about Verilog, but there's tons more of community su support for it now than VHDL. So that was really the answer, is it was just much better supported, I could find much better tools, I'm lazy, and I don't want to have to rewrite everything from scratch. Um, there's also a lot of design examples out there, so I've compiled a huge amount of test cases from open cores from GitHub. I just grab anyone's code I can possibly get, go through, synthesize it, and shove it through my tool chain to make sure it's gonna work. Oh yes, so here is my first of many pre-recorded demos. I apologize that these are all, let's see if this will, is it that going to run? I apologize these are all pre-recorded since I had to get these slides through public um, uh, release. I had to have the demos pre-recorded. If you want live demos, I have them afterwards. But this is what our basic workflow looks like where you're importing netlist, you're importing files that I'm calling helper files, which are the standard cell definitions. So they're basically what ands are and ors and nots and flip flops and all that good jazz we'll go through later. Um, and then you get out a decompiled netlist. Um, right now we're not extremely decompiled, pretty much uh, particularly in this picture, but it will resynthesize and um, you can generate test benches off of it and everything like that, and they're getting to look better and better. This is still a work in progress, but this is my general workflow here. I've improved the GUI since, um, since this was recorded. I now have dark mode. Um, if you notice, there is an undo button there. Fuck you, Igor. <laughs> I had an undo two weeks in. You didn't get one until Ghidra came out. Um, anyway. So, up oh, and we are, okay. Excellent, all right. So now let's, now that we've introduced the problem, I've kind of introduced my crappy looking GUI um, and we can actually get into the meat of what's going on. So there are three steps to decompiling software. You parse it, you analyze it, and then you recompile it. Um, and I'll bring this graph up basically every, um, every time I go through and do a section transition because we're going to walk through these three steps and that'll help um, orient you as to where I am in the talk and also that way you, you kind of, I don't dive too deep in the weeds and you lose sight of the general goal. So we're going to talk about parsing first because it's the first thing you have to do when you decompile software. All right, so parsing in software 
is actually hard. The first thing you run into when you try to write a software decompiler or even a software disassembler is what is called the halting problem. And it basically says there is no good way to tell the difference between code and inline data. This is very obvious when you think about x86 or something like the 8051. By the way, all my code examples are 8051 code, not x86 or ARM, just if you're wondering what architecture that is. I, I don't know why I have a soft spot in my heart for 8051s. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, they're fantastic microcontrollers. They're hilarious. Um, but anyhow, they're actually a dense instruction set. So every byte except for, I think, A5 is an instruction. So telling the difference between instruction and data, and they're also aligned by one, not aligned by four or aligned by 16, is really impossible. You can do some statistics and you can guess. So um, right off the bat, you start out and parsing is hard in software. All right, so um, I have to actually introduce a little bit of terminology now because I'm going to go on a rant um, in a minute and I figure I should do the terminology introduction um, pre-rant uh, so that I don't interrupt my rant. So how many of you guys know what a flip-flop is? Excellent, then I can skip this slide. All right, so parsing in hardware, I am using a um, open source tool called Verilator. I don't know if any of you have heard of Verilator. Verilator is awesome. Um, I don't work with the Verilator guys. I don't work for the Verilator guys. The Verilator guys are the shit. Um, they, they really do a good job. It's a linting tool. It's a um, tool chain. Um, one of the really nice things it does, though, is it'll crunch through Verilog and output this XML file that is your abstract syntax tree for your um, Verilog. Since my Verilog netlist is still Verilog, I can just run it through Verilator and voila, I have an abstract syntax tree and my parsing problem is solved. Um, the only thing that, there are two things that don't work here. One of them is primitives, and we'll talk about primitives in a second. Um, they're basically lookup tables. They're really kind of nasty and you'll have to, they're just gross. So we had to write some code to parse them. And the other thing is it turns out that Xilinx just isn't compatible with any standard whatsoever. So right now I currently don't support Xilinx stuff because fuck Xilinx. I mean, seriously, who uses deassign statements in 2020? Any of you old enough to know what a deassign statement is? Okay. So, so, so basically at one point, it, it's an old optimizer thing. It was taken out of the standard in I think the 80s. And for whatever reason, Xilinx was like, no, we like deassign statements and they're still in there and they've given me like a lot of headaches. Anyhow, um, moving on, primitives are, um, primitives are lookup tables. So this very light and excellently readable example here is a primitive. But basically you go through and you don't want to actually describe stuff in terms of ands, ors, and nots, so you just dump a lookup table in there. And this usually is a lookup table that um, is whenever you're actually storing data, um, you tend to describe what's happening at one clock edge and then what's happening at the next clock edge. And while you do this by using equal signs with perhaps a little carrot in front of them depending on whether you're doing continuous assign or not, um, under the hood what your tool chain is doing is shoving these nasty lookup tables into your netlist. And we had to actually go through and write some code to turn those into something that was both synthesizable and readable. But that was, that was the only hard part. Um, it's actually also on top of that, netlists already are in close to conjunctive normal form. So if you are, um, how many of you are geeky enough to know what conjunctive normal form is? All right, we have a few geeks in here. Excellent, you will love this talk, I promise you. Um, so 
Uh, net lists are pretty much already described in terms of ands, ors, nots, si uh, two by two matrix operations if you had a logic class in undergrad. Um, and that's really kind of nice for actually doing any solvers or symbolic computation or reasoning over them because you don't have to go through and figure out, well, this is a call instruction. It's what, uh, tw two, 3,000 lines to describe a call instruction in C code from the x86 architecture. I don't, how, how have you, many of you have actually looked at the x86 call instruction? It's disgusting. If not, you should totally do this. This, this explains a lot about x86. Um, but I don't have to worry about any of that because I'm already in a very arithmetic and graph-friendly format. All right, so I have another lovely pre-recorded demo of me um, parsing our netlist. And one of the things we do here is actually suck out everything from all of the standard cell definitions that you can grab out of your tool chain, put it into one giant module or function for you software people. Oh yes, and that's our very ugly graphs. Um, so that you have everything in the same spot. It's also completely flattened to the point where even the standard cells are inlined and replaced with the logic constructions that they should be. So I, um, the fact that I got rid of all of that means that I am actually compatible with pretty much any tool chain out there besides Vivado. Um, okay, so now we c I'm going to skip the analysis step for a second and actually talk next about the recompilation step. And the reason why I'm doing this is because the analysis step is going to be the re rest of this talk and the recompilation step is really simple. So if you know what a depth first search is, that is uh, all you really have to do. You walk your abstract syntax tree, it outputs code in the language of your choice, and you're done. And it's the same in hardware as software. It's not very exciting. So now we can get on to the interesting stuff. So there's a lot of steps in between producing an abstract syntax tree and actually having a structure that turns into readable code you can output. So one of the big things that you do in software is when you're going to do any sort of decompilation decomp is you're looking at flow. You're looking at structure because this is what humans see as organized. There is no difference to your machine as to the giant flattened file of 60,000 lines of a netlist that I showed you. And the, um, this file, it synthesizes the same. It gives you the same results when you plug it through a test bench. It meets timing. Everything's good. But what people see as readable is hierarchy. So basic blocks are the first thing in software to making readable code. Everyone knows what a basic block is, right? Good. So hardware, we don't have an instruction pointer. We don't have instructions. And I'm pretty sure this is where most people give up. Uh, so I, I didn't really want to give up here. I was, I was having way too much fun. I had found Verilog. I, I, I had found my calling in life. Um, and I wanted to actually make this work. So I asked, what are we actually trying to do here? We don't, we don't necessarily care that these are instructions um, and that some of them are branches or calls. We care that this is representing how data um, is flowing through a design and how the design is transitioning from one state to another. So those are still questions you can answer even without an instruction pointer or without um, any sort of instruction set. All right, so this is what flow looks like in hardware. Um, I have a fantastic analogy for this. Um, I don't know if this audience will need this, but I will give it to you anyway because the electrical engineers actually like this. So if you ever have to explain the difference between hardware and software to a software person, you can explain to them that hardware is exactly like software except for that electrons move at the speed of electricity. So uh, to be a little bit more, more uh, precise about this, you can think of 
um, flip flops, uh, gates or flip flops and uh, latches that are going through and basically gating your design and measuring data transferring from one spot to another as buckets full of ping pong balls. And you release the buckets full of ping pong balls down the hill and they roll down the hill through a maze of ands, ors, and nots and then they settle into the next row of buckets. And at the next clock edge, you go through and you look and say, that has enough ping pong balls in it, that looks like a one. Um, and continue on from there. So the big thing is that hardware happens all at the same time, except for when you're actually doing something that is latching. And then you need time for it to settle out and your buckets to fill up with ping pong balls. So there's basically two, 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 um, two things to hardware. There is combinational logic, which is your ands, ors, nots, xors, and so on and so forth. And there is sequential logic, which is your flip-flops, latches, IO, and anything else that needs to wait for a clock edge if you're a good designer. Um, yes, you can do things that aren't clock oriented. No, I'm not going to talk about them now. If you don't know exactly what you're doing by doing things not on a clock edge, you shouldn't be doing things not on a clock edge. All right. So I break my, um, all of my abstract syntax trees or graphs, which I'll use those two words interchangeably depending on what presentation it is, but it, they're really the same thing, right? Um, into two pieces, a combinational graph and a sequential graph. Um, and this actually turned out to be a really, really good thing for a large number of reasons. I don't normally consider myself particularly bright, but I must have woken up on the day, right side of the bed the day I decided to do this because it actually worked out really well. Um, one, one of the thing is it naturally um, splits the design up into two pieces. The piece that is controlling what's going on in your design, your state changes, um, and then your uh, logic, which is, is basically you know, how you flow from one state to the next, or you can think about your sequential graph is the diagram of your basic blocks, and your combinational graph is the logic in those basic blocks. The other thing that turned out to be really nice about this is your combinational graph is now directed acyclic. Any of you actually know what a directed acyclic graph is? Yes. You, you are a fantastic audience. Um, so basically, this gives you, if you don't know what a directed acyclic graph is, it has no loops where you have an output of one thing going into an input of next, and that keeps you from getting lost th as you walk through the graph for algorithms. So you don't end up in an infinite loop checking the same node over and over again when you don't know what's going on, and it greatly improves your runtime for a lot of stuff. All right, so um, I did make one other choice here that I'm still uh, on little on the fence about, um, and that is I decided that nodes were going to be both operations and wires or variables for you software people. Um, uh, so that made my graph quite a lot bigger. It did end up turning out, I'm pretty satisfied with it. I don't know that I necessarily needed to do this, but there I am. Um, so let's go ahead and look at one of my very ugly graphs, which by the way, I have since I recorded these moved to Gephi for graph displays. You'll see a couple Gephi images in there. I used to be calling Gephi uh, just afterwards opening it up after I saved off my graph. It does a way better job than I do at displaying things nicely. So I'm not, not a front end anything programmer. I really, I don't care if it looks horrible. I, I, I just want to muck through a graph. Um, that's it's just, it's just the type of person I am. So here's our really nasty looking uh, combination of, oh, and sequential graphs for a counter. Um, don't worry, some of the demos get more exciting later on and I don't just do counters. I've actually tried this on like a four core risk processor before and it only takes a couple of hours, which I was fairly impressed about. Um, all right, so. Here is an example of one of my graphs. Um, this is an AES core. 
Um, AES Core, by the way, is fantastic for this. This is one of the designs off Open Cores. If you've never seen Open Cores before, check out Open Cores. They have a good repository of mostly broken designs that you can play around with. Um, this is their AES core. It, um, it has a decent number of gates. It's not an overly large netlist. It is fantastic to work with because it's a highly structured netlist. So I've been working with basically this in a RISC processor and like a couple of IO designs and then I have an ALU when I want to play around with small stuff so I get a good variety of different types of designs. But as you can see, even though I went through and shoved this into a graph, it's not really any more readable than it was before. You're not going to divine as to this is an AES design by looking at that graph. So, um, we have another hardware for software people. Um, I'm sure everyone here knows what a module is, right? A module is a function for hardware. The big difference between modules and functions is you call a function. So when you call a function, you are redirecting your instruction pointer to a chunk of bits that are in a specific location. When you instantiate a module, you're making new hardware. It has to be physically on the chip somewhere, right? So it takes up space. Um, you may have multiple copies of it. You may instead have a whole bunch of wires going into the same copy because you're space constrained rather than timing constrained. But this, this makes finding modules weird as compared to finding functions. So, um, yeah, that's, this was my very first thing. I'm like, oh great, I can make graphs. They look like crap. Um, so I want to consolidate them as much as possible. Finding modules seemed like the same first step in this. Um, and I've actually been fairly successful at this. I have a number of algorithms we'll walk through that do this. But this is a general idea of what you want, is you want to find known modules just like you find function signatures. All right. So as I said before, um, functions in software are much easier to find than modules, not only because you don't as instantiate multiple copies of them, well, sometimes you do, people really, linkers are lazy. Um, anyhow, uh, so you have, you also, when you call a function, you go through and have a call instruction and a return instruction at the end of the function. And this is great, and you usually do some stack stuff, so even if you're analyzing malware and there's no call and there's return, you'll see them pushing stuff onto the stack and then doing jumps, right? Um, so there's a clear indication of when the start of your function is and where the end of your function is and who's calling your function. Well, hardware does not have an instruction pointer, as I keep saying. so. We don't know where our functions start. They don't have any stack setup or teardown. We don't know where they end. They're all in this one big, giant, nasty graph. Um, so we have to find them. So we tend to use graph mining algorithms to do this. One of the nice thing about, things about hardware is there's a lot less variety, actually, than software. Hardware is, if you're putting something in hardware, you are spending a huge amount of time designing it. The upfront cost is astronomical, particularly if you're putting it in ASIC, you have to go get it fab. This is several hundred thousand dollars, even with a university at a legacy node size. It is not a light undertaking. So people in, with hardware tend to be much more regimented. They tend to um, use some very, uh, follow some very strict design guidelines. So there's a lot of stuff that you can go through and find where people are going to do the same thing every time in hardware. Um, and so I have a database that I have constructed of basically all the IEEE standard cells, which if you can, or a software person you can think of as like your C standard library, right? Um, that everyone uses. These are things like add, subtract, multiply, um, shove everything into, into one giant bus. 
and um, I have a database for them now to match to. So this is, this is what I'm doing to find um, modules if I know, you know, kind of what they are. Um, so this is akin to signature matching in software. There's been a lot of stuff people have been doing for signature matching. There's several good um, algorithms out there. All of your standard decompilers and disassemblers come with them. People write more all the time. I'm not going into this. Um, for hardware, since we don't have the stop, start stop con um, conditions, we have to do graph mining. We also have an issue with hardware is that basically there's a lot more variance in um, which standard cells you use and how they look than in software. Um, think about the differences between GCC or Visual Studio, right? Um, it, depending on which compiler you have, which architecture you have, you're going to have very different looking functions. Um, and when you're signature matching, you have to take that into account. With hardware, you're actually building for the device a physical device that you have. So you actually have a lot more freedom as far as what you want to do for trade-offs and there's, there's a lot more nuance that goes into this. So I really need to be agnostic to how you're implementing um, different operations. And I'm doing that by completely flattening everything out. All right, so now that I've set up that problem for probably way too long and bored everyone, let's actually get into matching algorithms. Um, the first thing you can do that's really easy is I'm using, um, I'm Python based and I'm using Network X to handle my graphs. And Network X has a graph isomorphism minor where you can go through and give it graph A and graph B and say how many copies of graph B is in graph A. And it will find that and it's really easy and I use it. And it works great sometimes. Um, one of the first things that you run into trouble with is labels, right? Because I said I was going through and having labels for every operation I had in there, all my ands, nots, ors, whatever. But for you guys who know what conjunctive normal form is, you know there are a bunch of equivalent ways to express the same operation. There are also um, if you have one design versus another design, you don't have any um, knowledge of what your variable name should be if you're working with an ASIC netlist. I know if you have a lot of debug options turned on in Vivado, you can get your variable names to propagate through your netlist and you don't have this problem. Um, but I'm assuming that kind of worst case scenario and that all my wires are named W1 through 3,952 in design A and W1 through, I don't know, 59,375 in uh, design B, and these names don't match up with anything. So um, I actually go through and strip all my labels and then do what I call topology-based matching, where I just say, is the number of inputs going to this the same? Is the number of outputs the same? Um, you know, is does it have the same number of branches in the graph? And this gives me a lot of, um, kind of a very large pool of candidates that may not be exactly right, but they're kind of, um, they're possible matches. So this is a um, necessary but not sufficient can um, condition for a matching candidate, right? Um, then I also um, go through and do a couple of things where I'm doing, rather than actually matching with isomorphism or topology matching, I'm doing graph similarity measures. I have um, a Levenstein distance similarity that works pretty well. It's a little bit slow. It's not too bad. Honestly, counting the inputs and outputs is probably the easiest way to go. And this is at the point where I'm introducing my solver. So if you notice and you're used to hardware stuff, you have seen a solver um, the whole way through. We are now seeing solvers very far down into this. And this is because I'm then putting very small graphs into the solver. I'm just testing a very small number of vectors and then this is computationally feasible. So that was the big deal with this is to come up with algorithms where I could actually have a reasonable runtime while I do my graph mining. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about data flow. Um, 
because this, this is where things get really exciting, right? So here, here's another picture of, um, I think this is a floating point unit here. Um, so on top of, we talked about how to find matching signatures. Now we have to talk about how to find um, basically buses, which are the arrays of the hardware world. Um, since you guys know what you're doing, we're going to skip what a bus is and what a multiplexer is. If you don't know those, please Google. All right, so um, one of the big things with data flow and hardware is everything goes into graphs and out of graphs one bit at a time, literally one bit at a time. So you actually, when you talk about finding endianness, which I've done some forensics before, right? Endianness sucks. It's miserable. This is way worse because you really have your full, for a 32-bit bus, you have what, 32 factorial combinations that you could possibly have going into this bus. And it's miserable. So um, I'm running two, two algorithms right now. One is a um, nearest neighbor algorithm for bus matching. And the other one is an endianist finding algorithm off of the University of Ruhr in Germany. They did a great job with it. I had to finagle it a lot to get it to work with my netlist, but it ended up working. So if you want to talk more about that, I'm not going to go into the details of it because it's, it's just a little bit boring for those of you who aren't mathematicians in the audience. Um, all right. So then the very last step of this is actually state machine recovery. Um, and this is kind of where I'm at now. I've gotten pretty good at recovering like bits and pieces of state machine. I'm still bringing this whole thing together. Um, so a state machine is basically exactly what it sounds like. You're in state A, you're going to state B, um, and you need a diagram basically of all of the possible states. Uh, like I said, all my software examples are really coming from just like the best parts of embedded software. Not that free RTOS is good or anything, but a lot of people use it. All right, so we want to actually eventually recover our state machine. Um, and we're doing this by looking at our sequential graphs here, which is basically all just your flip-flops because states ha state changes happen on clock edges if you're a good designer. Um, and um, so if you just look at which clock edges feed into which other clock edges after you've grouped buses, then you get your state transitions. And I'm actually now, um, if you want to, I can pull it up on the laptop afterwards for the post-session live demos um, that I can't show right now. Um, I, I'm actually getting pretty good at grouping buses and then coming up with a state diagram that's only a couple hundred nodes, which is reasonable for the size of design I'm looking at. And this is actually a, a somewhat readable, understandable, human interpretable um, output from the Verilog to Verilog decompiler. Um, I'm still getting a few other things that are, I have to deal with. Um, once you get into the part where you're recompiling, there's actually some aesthetics involved. I'm kind of bad at the aesthetics piece of this. I don't care. None of those three lines there make me cringe. Um, how, how many of you would, would, would fire an intern if they wrote the third line there? <laughs> if he did it twice. Okay, that's fair. You, you, everyone gets one. But yeah, so when, uh, as I go through, I actually have to re recreate things in an aesthetically pleasing fashion. Have not gotten to that yet. Um, this is going to be kind of tricky, um, and it's going to require a, thought, a lot of thought, and this is kind of where the software decompilers fail, because Ghidra will totally write that. All right, so um, as I said, um, I have, I want to add more algorithms. I want to finish up the state machine stuff. Um, I also am trying to get this, as you can see, I'm trying to get this through public release process. In the meantime, I'm also trying to get this onto GovCloud. 
So the half of you guys that have contractor badges who aren't willing to admit it, um, you can access this pretty much right now if you want to start uh, collaboration and development with me. Um, I am terrible at writing GUIs. If anyone wants to shove this into their front end, please, for the love of God, I don't want to do the front end on this. Um, I would be more than happy to put this into Binary Ninja, um, put this into Ida, Ghidra, whatever, if you want to actually support a hardware language. Um, also, if you know some better graphing tools, um, uh, graph manipulation tools or anything like that, please let me know. Like I said, I'm not good with the aesthetics. Um, and then uh, other than that, I do want to, I want to add more algorithms. If you have an algorithm you want me to add, please let me know. Um, if you are interested in adding algorithms yourself, please let me know. Um, and then I basically just need to wrap this up and actually get um, Verilog output back out of my graphs now that they're looking better. So, any questions, comments? Anyone fallen asleep during this? One person. All right. No, that, that is a good question. So I'm, um, he was asking if I'm using location information. Um, I am sort of using some of it, but not all of it. If you are near an I.O. pad, I probably know what you are, and I'll name you. Um, I also do let, when people re-edit edit things, they can name. I'm not keeping track of where in the GDS everything is. So I kind of know things are related to each other because they're close to each other in the graph anyway. Um, but I could add in some more spatial information. Um, it's, uh, I'm assuming though, as soon as you get past the IO pads into like probably three or four levels down in the graph, things get fairly tangled fairly fast. And at least locally, you're, you're pretty muxed. And that's actually when I said I was having trouble integrating some of the other algorithms, that's actually why, is because most people are assuming you have a netlist that's a little bit more structured, like you get out of the Xilinx tool set, and mine just very quickly become um, completely tangled. Oh, I didn't. Uh, you, you said, is that. Be oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So you asked, is, is that because the uh, design tools are doing space filling? Um, the fill actually doesn't come out into the netlist because it's not active circuitry usually. It is because the design tools are optimizing things heavily. Um, also, there's a lot of intermediate wires, and I get every wire in there. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the question was, how do you treat analog structures? The answer is, right now, I don't. I do have plans for that. I know how I want to do that. It's going to be, in some ways, a lot harder. Um, it's not going to have a big impact on the graph themselves. I'll just have a black box in there, but whenever I go to actually do any formal equivalents, then I'm going to need a simulator. Okay, excellent. I'll take more questions offline. Thank you guys. You have been a fantastic audience.